Good. Good morning. good morning and welcome on this lovely, lovely fall day. And it's good to have you here this morning. And I pray that God will meet us here and bless us. And whatever blessing you need to have, God will give it. We're delighted this morning to welcome uh, two particular guests. One, a repeat, and that's David Cowan here on the um, organ. He was here a few weeks ago. The last time when I was missing, you were here. And uh, now we've got James missing. And he's already sent us miserable photographs of his children playing on the beach somewhere <laughs> down south. <laughs> so he's having a good time while the rest of us suffer with David. Sorry, no, I don't mean that. Um, <laughs> We're, de we're delighted to have David because I know, I've known David for years. He used to fill in quite often at Knox Church in St. Catharines when I was there, and we're del delighted to have you. Uh, another friend we have this morning is a, at least a longtime friend of mine, is Dr. Roland de Vries, who's sitting here at the very front. And <coughs> Roland is currently principal of Presbyterian College in Montreal, where I once taught. And the first year of my teaching there was Roland's final year of his Master of Divinity degree. And as I like to say every time I see Roland, you know, I don't remember him ever lifting a pen once in any class of mine, writing anything down because, and I don't blame him because I was a total greenhorn and <laughs> Roland was very bright and still remains so. So Roland, we're delighted to have you here and uh, uh, hope that God will bless you as you bless us. Um, Everyone's invited over to the church hall for coffee hour, and I probably should ought to say that if you haven't uh, had your photograph taken uh, for the directory, and we want everybody to do that, then please make sure you get that done after church, either here or over in the church hall. Uh, Jane, you're here with your camera, so that's great, so please do that, for that at the coffee hour. Then at three o'clock this afternoon, we're going to have some tea or coffee and cake at three o'clock in the afternoon over in the church hall. I'm going the wrong way. Um, and Roland is going to talk to us about life at Presbyterian College Montreal. Um, I remember my time there very fondly, and I'm sure that it's, uh, uh, it's, it's changed over the years but with, under Roland's care, but I hope that you'll come. It's not, you don't have to come because you're thinking of going to be a student. Uh, just to find out what do they do in a theological college and how, do we, how does the church train men and women for ministry? That's really what he's going to talk about. And <clears throat> you always hear about Knox College in Toronto because it's much nearer to us. Well, I want you to hear about that other college in Montreal that doesn't get as much press up this direction. So come at 3 o'clock for tea. Tuesday morning, tidy up Tuesday, if you would like to help with that, 9 o'clock. Prime time on Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Uh, I hope you'll come. We have lots of laughter and occasional learning, so please come. Uh, that is so uh, such a worthwhile group, and I hope you will be there. And uh, I think those are all, all the things I need to mention. The rest of them you can um, see for yourself. Let's just pause a moment, and then we'll, God will call us to worship in uh, the words of Scripture. These words come from Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let us worship God.
say earlier a special welcome to those who are worshipping with us perhaps for the very first time. And I know there's one person here today who was baptized here, may have been here between his baptism and today, perhaps a few times, I don't know, but uh, I'm glad that you're here this morning. Let us pray. Let us pray. God of grace, there is no God like you in heaven above or earth below. You are utterly faithful to your promises and consistent in your love. Glorious God, the vast expanse of the universe cannot contain you, let alone this house of prayer. And yet you promise to meet us when we gather in the name of Jesus and you promise to bless us and direct us as we bring our praise. Lord, may all who seek you in this place find you through scripture, sermon, and song, and then leave this place ready and willing to live in ways that will honor our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you do not dwell in temples made by human hands, but take up residence in humble hearts. We come to confess that our hearts are not always humble, nor are our hearts always receptive to you. So often, our hearts and our lives are crowded out by other concerns. We confess that so often we are self-seeking and that envy and bitterness, pride and prejudice often shadow us, diluting our relationship with you and damaging our relationships with others. Merciful God, turn us, we pray, from our pettiness and pardon us, so that trusting Jesus to free us from our sin, we will delight in your way and love our neighbours as ourselves. All this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear this assurance of pardon. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding. I love that word, abounding in steadfast love. In Jesus, that grace mercy and love of God was lavished upon us. From his cross flows pardon for our sin and power to begin again. Thanks be to God. Amen. We now have a word from the 
chairman of the search committee, who is doubling today as our, what do they call it, streaming team. So Les, it's yours. Good morning. Good morning. A little chilly out today. Hint of winter coming. Well, things progress and so is our search for a new minister. So this morning I just wanted to give you a brief update on the progress that we've made to date. But before I do that, I'd like to remind you who the members of the committee are. And if they're present today, if they could just stand up when I mention their name. They are Lori Campbell. Don Chambers, is Don here? No. <laughs> He's never here. Mike Van Aken, who's behind me. David Parker, who's enjoying life in England right now. Jane Sanders, I think you're in the back corner there, Jane. Janice Thompson. Janice. Ken Wilms, is Ken here today? And with me is Clyde, our interim moderator, who's giving us a lot of guidance and support in this process, and we really appreciate his support. You can sit. Yeah. <laughs> <Get tired. clears throat> so what is our progress today? Well, if you'll remember, way back in July, we completed a congregational profile. And this profile is important that any potential candidates for the position of minister here knows a lot about us. That was approved by session in August, and if you need a copy, there are copies in the Kirk Hall. The profile was subsequently approved by Presbytery in late August and posted by the Presbyterian Church of Canada in early September. Now, so far, through Clyde, we've received 20 inquiries and requests for a copy of the profile, congregational profile. And through that process, we have now received personal profiles of 10 potential candidates. Now, the search committee has met several times and we are carefully reviewing these profiles and have initiated some follow-ups through Clyde. We anticipate we will probably receive a few more profiles in the coming weeks. And if anyone in the congregation knows of a potential candidate, they can speak to me or Clyde about that particular individual. Now, just to remind you, this is a very confidential pro process for some obvious reasons. So any names are to be kept within the confines of the search committee. So in closing, please pray for our deliberations and pray for the Lord's guidance and support and our ultimate success in finding a new minister. Amen. And thank you. Thank you, Les. Roland, have you thought about moving back to Ontario? <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a vote right after the sermon and see what happens. That'd be wonderful. And I should say to the principal of Presbyterian College, if you know any candidates who are looking, then send us their names. We'd be pleased to have that. We sing our hymn, and there are one or two children here to go out, so they'll go out with um, uh, Ashley, at, uh, but we'll sing together. Because Les noted at the end that uh, invited us to pray for the discernment of the search committee. We do so really based on this conviction that God is faithful to God's people. And so it's a good thing that we sing this hymn, three, two, four, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Good morning. It's a beautiful day in our neighborhood. And for this, we give thanks to the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, in this mixed up world we are living in, we need you to help us understand how our faith in you will see us through this mayhem. Amen. Let us begin this understanding with readings from the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament reading can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Page 131. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness for 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, with the, neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man did no, does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man dis disciplines his son, so the Lord, your God, disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering in him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, deep springs and gushing out into the valleys and the hills, and a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey a land where bread will not be squares, scarce, and you will lack nothing, a land here where rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and his decrees that I am giving you this day. And the New Testament reading is from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. It's found on page 741. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all the ten cleansed? Were all the, were all the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, good morning. It is uh, good to be here uh, with you this morning. As I was sitting there in my corner, I was sort of facing this way, and I saw the, the Canadian flag there in front of me, and in the right of my eye, I, I saw a blue and a white flag, and I thought, isn't that lovely? They, they brought out the fleur-de-lis, the <laughs> Quebec flag. And then I turned my head and, of course, saw St. Andrew's Cross. But uh, it is uh, good to be with you this morning, and I uh, look forward to the opportunity to share a little bit more this afternoon about the college. If you are not able to stay, there are a few brochures uh, on your way out, and certainly uh, take one of those, uh, if you will, on your way out today. This morning I'm not going to begin with a lot of preliminaries. We're going to launch right into our subject, and we're going to begin with a brief reflection on memory. And we'll begin with the basic fact that memory makes us human. I think we all realize this. Memory is vital to life and human identity. The fact that memory is so basic to who we are is what makes the thought, perhaps, of losing memory so worrying. It's what makes it distressing to think about the possibility that we might lose our memory. It seems that without memory, we aren't fully ourselves. On this challenging side of the ledger, I'm not going to say too much for the moment, but perhaps in the light of the challenges and the thought of loss of memory, the most important thing is to remember that we are held in the memory of God. Of course, there is that negative and challenging side of memory that we can talk about, the challenge, the prospect of losing memory, but we can and also should talk positively and constructively about memory. For example, the hopes that I have today as a person might relate to my memories. If I hope for a relationship in which I am loved and cared for, perhaps it is because I remember being in such a relationship in the past. If I hope for employment, for a job that is fulfilling and gratifying, perhaps it is because I have a memory of fulfilling work in the past. If I hope for a meaningful visit with my family, perhaps it is because I have memories of meaningful visits with family in the past. Our memories shape us. They shape our hopes for the future. And we can say that memory also gives meaning to our everyday lives in another very basic sense. Think of the question of why we are here today. A very simple question. Why am I here today? In many ways, if I want to answer this question, I have to appeal to memories. In the big picture of things, I know I'm here today because I completed and I remember completing a Master of Divinity at the Presbyterian College 20 years ago. Before that, my wife and I moved to Montreal so I could study at McGill and at the college. Perhaps I'm also here because of my relationship with Clyde. I remember him as my director of pastoral studies and the relationship we've built over the years. Perhaps I'm here also because I remember what a lovely town it is and remember visiting here from Beamsville where my dad was minister and coming here a number of times with them. The meaning of my presence here today is rooted in part at least in the past and in the remembrance of the past in memories. When it comes to something as simple as understanding why we are here, each of us who's here has to appeal to memory. Each of you has your own memories to explain and tell a story about why you're here today. And what we want to do this morning is to think about the reality of human memory in relation to the story we've heard from Luke's Gospel. Some of us may have heard it many times before, and sometimes when that's the case, it's hard to hear it with fresh ears, but we are going to try. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. And as he comes through a village, a group of men with a skin disease approach him from a distance. They had heard about Jesus. And having heard the amazing stories about him, they shout out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when Jesus sees them and hears them, he says to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. 
It seems like an abrupt and odd response to these men, but the key to this is to understand that it is the priest who can declare when your skin is healed. It's the priests who can declare that you have been made clean and can pave the way for you back into human community and society. As these men go on their way to see the priests as we read, they discover that they have, in fact, been healed. Then we read, Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to the one, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. It's interesting to think about what the church has done with this text in the past. Very often, this story of Jesus, it seems to me, is read in something of a moralizing kind of way. Nine of the ten forgot to say thank you. Nine of the ten failed to offer thanks to Jesus. Nine of the ten didn't remember Jesus in a full sense. So the story is read in terms of morality. The lesson is, it is good to say thank you. Express the other way around, those people who don't say thank you, well, you don't want to be one of them. Bad behavior. Of course, we all want to be good people. We want to do the right thing. We want to give thanks to God for family and friends, food and creation, as we did last weekend, as we continue to do in our lives. The right thing, saying thank you. But at this moment, I'm going to say something that you might find odd, perhaps even offensive. It seems to me that in the Gospels, Jesus doesn't particularly care whether people are good or not. For Jesus in the Gospels, life in God's kingdom isn't about passing some moral test. It's not about being a good person in terms of some standard that is laid out before us. It's not about following a set of moral rules. Jesus isn't saying that if you want to be a good person, you should learn to say thank you. So the point is not that one leper was a good person. The point seems to be, rather, that in his remembrance of Jesus and in his gratitude toward Jesus, he found the fulfillment of his life. He praised God for his healing. He went back to encounter Jesus in gratitude. He threw himself down at the feet of Jesus. He understands he has been healed and remembers it is Jesus who has done this. And he realizes that his healing will not be complete. He will not be truly human until he is back in the presence of Jesus. It's only when he's back in the presence of this one that he finds wholeness. This wholeness includes his physical healing, of course, but so much more. Jesus says to the man, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has brought salvation to you together with me. The other nine men with skin disease, they were physically healed. They also got to go back to their families. They also got to go back to their lives. And no doubt they had a memory somewhere of this astonishing Jesus. But they didn't return to Jesus. And what they missed out on was the fullness of life with him. Memory isn't only a fact of our lives. It's not just that we have this set of memories lodged in our brains. It's not simply a neutral, objective reality that we each have our own memories. Of course, that is true. Rather, the human capacity for memory presents us with a task. What are we going to do with these memories? What is the meaning of these memories? Our human task is this, 
by the grace of the Holy Spirit, to incorporate the memories of our lives into our lives and into our life with God in Christ. The other nine remembered, as we said. No doubt, they remembered Jesus. But they didn't draw that memory into the depths of their lives. They didn't let it shape them. They didn't let that memory bring them back into the presence of Jesus. And so they lived in a kind of forgetfulness, even if the memory was there. They didn't allow that memory of gracious encounter to bring them back to him for life and grace and healing. Now, the gospel writer makes a point. The one who did remember, he was a Samaritan. He didn't even belong to the people of God. He didn't attend church regularly, if you will, like the others did. He wasn't on the inside of the religious community. But he's the one who remembered. He's the one who brought the memory of his healing into his sense of self and his life with Christ. His joyful remembrance set him on the way with Jesus. What have we said so far? We have said the following, that memory makes us human. To some extent, our memories make us who we are. Without our memories, it's hard to see how we are ourselves. Yet we are ourselves because we are held in the memory of God. And the human capacity for memory gives us a lifelong task. What will we do with our remembering? What will we do with our memories? There are so many good things we remember. Things to draw into our life with God today. Memories that give us a task in another sense. We remember past experiences of the creation and all of its beauty. And in those memories, we can begin again to take care of creation. We remember relationships of care and compassion that we have had. And in remembering those relationships, we can commit ourselves to serve others in the same way. We can remember meaningful work we have done in our lives and in remembering to be grateful for the work that others do for us. This is what it looks like when we engage in the task of remembering in faith. And then there are also the deep challenges of life that we remember. We remember broken relationships. There is pain in our remembering. We remember those who are no longer with us. There is loneliness in our remembering. We remember times of loss. There is uncertainty and grief in our remembering. The invitation of this story is to take our painful memories also of loss and grief and to return and to sit with Jesus in the remembrance of those painful things. To draw those painful memories into our life with Christ on the way to healing and grace that is his intention for us. When we throw ourselves down at the feet of God in gratitude and thanks, or when we throw ourselves down at the feet of Jesus, crying out, Lord, have mercy on me. Then we are on the way to living faithfully with our memories. It's not about being a good person. It's not about obeying the rules. It's about finding abundant life. What our risen Lord cares about above all is our discovery of abundant life with and among each other. He cares about all the memories that shape us, that make us who we are, and the way that those memories might find their place in our lives as we walk forward toward his grace and healing. Perhaps the final thing we might say this morning so we live in a culture that functions with a kind of amnesia in relation to God. An amnesia in which we are sometimes implicated also. We can be so forgetful of God. Our culture has in many ways forgotten God, has forgotten Jesus. But again, let our response 
to this reality not be a moralizing one that says, yeah, look at them, they've forgotten God. Not a response of judgment because it doesn't capture God's intention for us. What we want for our world, what we desire for our neighbors and our friends, for our family and ourselves, is that we all might remember the grace of God and enter into encounter with him. That all of us might go and sit with Jesus with all of our memories, the good memories, the indifferent memories, the painful memories, and that we all might learn what our memories mean in encounter with him. In a way, maybe that's really what evangelism is. A longing, a heart, and a desire that all those we know and encounter with their memories would discover the meaning of sitting together in the presence of Jesus. Some of our memories are of painful things, and Jesus may bring healing. Some of our memories cause us confusion, and Jesus will bring us clarity. Some of our memories are filled with joy, and we will sit at his feet and praise him together. One of the ten comes back to Jesus. In coming back, he remembers Jesus, and he discovers abundant life. In remembering, he was saved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Years ago, I was Roland's teacher. This morning, it's reversed. He's been my teacher, and a very good one. Thank you, Roland, very much for shedding light on that very familiar story and adding meaning to it that I had never thought about before. Wonderful, thank you. God is good, and it's good. It's good. And we are good to God. So please, whether you're good or bad, the offering will now be received.
this morning you have given us again your word. Receive the gifts we now bring to you, and Lord, use them to help our church be a good witness to Jesus and his grace, near and far. giving and supplication. God of all generations, we thank you this day for the church of all ages of which we're a part, and for the wisdom of the past that we've inherited, and which we can joyfully, perhaps even sometimes painfully, remember. We give thanks for those who have translated the scriptures, those who wrote and are writing our hymns, who built our churches, and who to us exemplified Christian commitment. Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of those who have passed on the gospel to us, especially those particular people we remember, parents, teachers, ministers, special friends, who taught us to love you and our neighbor. Now, O oh Lord, we, we pray for your church. Where it is strong, keep it humble. Where it is weak, give it strength. Where it is wrong, correct it. And where it is lukewarm, revive it. Lord, we pray today for all those training to become ministers in our churches. And so we pray for Roland and his ministry at Presbyterian College, grant that he and all who are taught there may be given insight into Scripture and its utter relevance to, our, to life. We pray for our own congregation. Open our hearts and minds to follow Jesus and by your Spirit lead us in the way of peace. Give insight to the search committee as it discerns the person who might lead St. Andrews into the future. Be present, God of all compassion, to our church members and friends who are weak or weary. Encourage those who feel lonely or lost. And inflame all of us with a passion to serve you in our day and generation, and to so live for Christ that others see glimpses of him in us. God of all nations, whose power is directed by love, we bring the world to you in all of its complex problems, problems that threaten the livelihood of many. We pray for a willingness within well-off nations like our own to share what we have. We pray for justice in nations where corruption is rife. We pray across the world for people to see in one another, no matter how different we may be, those whom you've made and those whom you love. We continue to pray for Ukraine, O oh Lord. Protect its people from despair. Fill them with resolve and hope. And above all, Lord, may their enemies retreat. Finally, we pray for ourselves. Help us, faithful God, to be faithful to you as we live each day. Watch over our words and actions as parents, grandparents, neighbors, workers, friends, so that we help one another and never hinder any in finding you. All these things we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us what we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory.
mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest upon you now and always.